In this lecture, we're going to begin exploring uh, the pastoral vocation. Uh, what does it mean to do pastoral care? What is pastoral ministry? We'll look at a little bit at the history of how uh, uh, the pastoral ministry has been thought of throughout the history of the church, uh, and talk about some biblical uh, perspectives. And all of this is kind of uh, providing a foundation uh, for us to begin thinking about uh, our own context and what does it mean to be a youth pastor or to be a worship leader or uh, to be a pastor of, of a congregation or what does it mean and look like to do pastoral care. So I, I, I want to begin by revisiting this idea of crystal praxis that um, you know we spent some time talking about how uh, Andy Root describes pastoral care as God's ministry and that we're participating in God's ministry and use that term kind of crystal praxis to say how we are being called to participate and enter into the ministry that God is already doing. And I want to expand that just a little bit by thinking about Exodus chapter 3. And now the Exodus 3 story is the story of God's call uh, of Moses uh, in the burning bush. Uh, and we we, we get this in Je, uh, Exodus 3, verse 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And then Moses responds by saying, um, when God says, so now, this is verse 10, so now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out. Verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And verse 12, and God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the, the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And then Moses says, okay, so what if I go and they, they uh, don't believe me? Or they say, what, what is the name of this God? Uh, verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you shall say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now, what's interesting is that name I am can often represent being. But in this context, the, the name um, may better represent God's presence. Um, I will be. Uh, I will be with you. And it... it it seems to fit with what God says to Moses. I will be with you, and this is a sign that I will be with you. So all of this is for us to begin thinking about pastoral care in the terms of a ministry of transformational presence. How do we become signs of God's presence in the world? Um, and again, this fits with crystal praxis, this idea that God is already at work uh, in the world, and now... How do we participate with that? And how does our life and our activity within the community become a sign that God, of God's action, of what God is doing? Now, to understand this, the term pastor is actually a rural term, which, which means it's, it's agricultural. Um, so you talk about a pastoral scene of kind of a countryside. And in the context of, of pastoral ministry, it's very much grounded in Moses and Abraham and and David, they were all shepherds. And so pastoral ministry for the longest time has been thought of in the terms of shepherding, of how one leads or cares for a flock of people. And that has had uh, an influence in how people have thought of pastoral ministry. Um, so let's think a little bit historically on this issue of, of pastoral care. And we're just going to stop at, at different points and talk about a few different people as a way to kind of help us think about pastoral care, where it's been, and, and maybe what are some of the contemporary issues. So first, uh, Augustine. Um, Augustine would talk about the cure of souls. So Augustine lived back in the 300s AD, or 400s AD, um, and was a leader in the church, uh, very influential uh, in that kind of pre-modern um, uh, and, and patristic period. And Augustine kind of follows the, um, the way in which philosophy was thought of. So philosophy was thought to be a form of rhetoric that could bring health to a disordered soul. So um, Augustine especially would talk about being rightly or wrongly directed. Where is our desires 
directed. And in philosophy, it was, where is our reason and wisdom directed towards towards what? Towards things that are eternal and can sustain us or things that are fleeting? And so it was the idea that philosophy would lead to truth and that philosophy would lead to wisdom, which is a rightly ordered life. And so Augustine takes this over into the church and, and gives this sense of the rhetoric of God's word. That God speaks a word that brings order from chaos. So think about Genesis Genesis 1, God speaks and brings light from dark, order from chaos. And in the same way, the word that is spoken in Jesus Christ is a word that brings salvation, that brings healing. And that healing is a rhetoric. It's, it's helping us direct our, our love to God, which then rightly orders our lives, which in a sense brings redemption or salvation and transformation. And in this way, Augustine believed that the church was a hospital for the sick. Uh, and, and through our worship, through liturgy and the sacraments and prayer, these were all God's word that transformed us and, and changed us and guided us into truth. Uh, and so therefore, pastoral care was, was very much seen as being a part of the church and as a part of bringing people into the practices of the church through liturgy, sacraments, and, and the preaching of the word. Gregory the Great comes um, kind of uh, just as Rome is falling, and he writes this book on pastoral care. He's, he's, he's a pope, and he writes this, this book on pastoral care where he uses and picks up on this physician language and this shepherd imagery and argues that a pastor needs to be someone who is, is, has their feet in two worlds. One is the world of contemplation. And so he would talk about drinking the clearest water of truth, that, that a pastor needs to be grounded in scripture and prayer and worship and silence and meditation. All of these practices that we would associate with the monastic life to a certain degree but then has to have another foot kind of grounded in the life of the world, in the life of the congregation and the people to whom this person is ministering. Um, now, Gregory is very clear that we have to be careful that we don't have a divided mind, so that the pastor needs to make sure that they're focused on the right things, so that their desires and and uh, their wisdom is grounded in God and is nurtured by scripture and prayer and these practices. Uh, but again, that life of contemplation needs to then play itself out in the way that they love their flock. Um, that the pastor must love the supreme shepherd who is Christ, and in doing so then will love their flock that in the same way that Christ loves the church, the pastor will then love the people of the church. And, and so the life of the pastor is really a life of love and action. It, it is in some ways a life of contemplation, being grounded in these practices, but it is definitely a life of action. Uh, but again, you can see that pastoral care takes place within the church uh, as, as, as the community, and it's done by the pastor. Now, John Calvin uh, comes along, and, and we, we've kind of moved into the Reformation here. And what's interesting is that Calvin kind of continues some of these things that Augustine and, and Gregory would emphasize, uh, but does so out of a kind of reformational or reformed perspective. So um, for Calvin, uh, the, the work of uh, pastoral work is, is about formative education. So you get this notion of schooling and teaching that comes for Calvin, that, that we as humans have kind of forgotten who we are, we've lost our way, and so therefore we need to um, be taught, and we need to have our humanity formed and shaped and schooled into the humanity of Jesus Christ. And so really then, this pastoral care becomes an enculturation into kind of a way of life and a way of being human. And this is, it very much takes up the practices of the early church. So, scripture reading, praying the hours, psalm singing, moral surveillance and accountability. In other words, for Calvin, church discipline was very important given what had happened kind of during the medieval period. And so, in the Christian community, the, the elders, the, the, the elders and deacons, the leaders of the church, 
uh, would discipline the congregation. They would, they would um, keep them morally accountable. Um, and that was an important part of the formative process. And so as you think about going to church to hear the preaching and the teaching and to pray and to sing and, and again, to be held accountable, and then ultimately in the mystical union with God through, through the Lord's Supper, that Calvin saw this being united with Christ in the same way that many of the uh, uh, people in the early church, like Augustine and, and Gregory, uh, would see. Now, he, he sees it a little differently Right, he's he's reformed in the Reformation, and so there's been some, you know, kind of tweaks to this. But you can see how pastoral care kind of continues uh, on from the way Augustine and, and Gregory um, would have it. And the point of these practices is really to show people how to live as the people of God. That you're being formed and shaped. You're being educated uh, into what it means to be an. Uh, uh, um, to be part of the Christian community, to live as one of uh, um, the children of God, um, and then to be united united to Christ, and and so uh, again for Calvin, you can begin to see the, how these formative practices uh, play an important role. Now it's important to recognize these practices don't save for Calvin. Um, you know, as, as a Reformation person, as a Reformed person, very clear to, to distinguish between justification and sanctification. And these practices are really about sanctification. Uh, when, once we have encountered the living Christ and we are justified through faith, we're formed and shaped to become like Christ. And that is pastoral care. Now, it's important to see also for Calvin, there maintains this kind of clerical emphasis that it is in the church. It is ordained pastors who are doing this work. Uh, and so you still kind of maintain the the clergy emphasis here on who does the pa the pastoral uh, the pastoral work. Now, as we move into the modern kind of world and begin to think about uh, modern pastoral care, um, it, it begins to develop alongside kind of uh, the, de the development of the social sciences within modernity. So, as you think about the development of psych psychology and counseling and social work and sociology and all of these different disciplines and all these different ways of thinking about what does it mean to be human and 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 how do we understand the human person uh, pastoral care began to take on especially in the late 1800s early 1900s the influence of of these kind of modern disciplines and modern practices uh, to the point where pastoral care becomes a, a, almost like a form of counseling so now we can think about you know, the one-on-one -on -one sessions where somebody will come and they'll talk to their pastor and they'll be counseled. The emphasis is really in this context on the individual. And what, what develops during this is this whole kind of focus on self-actualization. How do we help people begin to realize their potential? Um, and so uh, pastoral care gets connected with institutions. Um, so chaplaincy, like in the hospitals, in the military, in schools. So chaplaincy gets connected into modern institutions. And these modern institutions are forming and shaping us in particular ways. And so the chaplaincy stuff becomes a part of that formative, uh, formative process. And so again, you can see how pastoral care begins to take on kind of a modern, a modern perspective. And, and you can also see here how uh, it still retain it, it still remains the activity of the professional. So while it's still the pastor and in the church, especially as we think about um, the the clerical paradigm, right, and the pastor who is ordained, that they're the ones who um, undertake this kind of pastoral uh, pastoral care. It begins to model itself after the professionalization of certain things within the modern world. So counselors and chaplains and, and so on. And so we see the kind of connection between professional counseling and pastoral care. Professional counseling is grounded in the social sciences, very much grounded in the kind of the medical sciences. Uh, pastoral, care, uh, pastoral care might it, it is biblical and theological, but it also retains this kind of clerical perspective, this kind of authority. Uh, of the pastor uh, paradigm and, and very much kind of connects itself to many of the modern uh, influences um, that we see here with the social sciences. And then we get to uh, 
postmodern pastoral care. So on the left here, I have a picture of Elaine Graham, and she's written a, quite a bit on kind of a postmodern approach to practical theology and pastoral care. And what ends up happening here is a, uh, a shift away from kind of the modern stuff. Um, you know, if we think about modernity and we think about reason and, and uh, institutions uh, and professionalization and bureaucracy, um, post-modernity begins to pull, uh, basically ask questions about this. And it asks questions about the nature of authority. And it begins to ask questions about power dynamics that exist within these institutions and in these different ways of life. And in particular, what we end up with are questions about a patriarchy and whiteness and this connection with kind of the Western world and the rise of modernity. Uh, and so Elaine Graham's work really focuses on practical theology and pastoral care kind of in a new context. What does it look like in pastoral care to begin to no longer focus on the individual, to no longer uh, be grounded in these kind of clinical approaches, but to ask questions about the importance of relationality and the community. Um, and, and maybe pastoral care is uh, can be returned to some of these dynamics of the Christian community of worship and liturgy and, and, and so on. Um, but I think just as important is, is are some of the questions that we've talked about as we think about liberation theology, feminist theology, and, and kind of questions about language. And to, to really begin to pull at the power dynamics of language and the power dynamics established within a particular culture uh, as a way to do pastoral care. That pastoral care isn't just now about the individual, but now pastoral care is concerned about the broader social and cultural dynamics. It's concerned with issues of justice. It's, it wants to speak into some of the patterns of the broader culture as a way to think about how we care for one another and how the difference that the gospel makes. And, and so now the gospel is in, in, in Christian faith is coming into conversation with all of these, these um, kind of different uh, aspects of the social and, and cultural life. Now, another way to think about this are boundaries and horizons. So, you know, she, she kind of unpacks this a little bit by saying, look, we're often kind of bound by the limitations of our own perspective. We think, well, this is how the world is, and this is how the world should be, and we need something to kind of come in and begin to ask questions about that. And then the horizons are that which is beyond the world that we know, that what is that mystery? What is that otherness? What is, how do we transcend the world as we've come to know it and open ourselves up to new possibilities. What awaits kind of our discovery? And, and this is where we can speak of new creation and, and eschatology and newness. And so she does all of this in the context of the gospel, in the context of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How does the cross break open these limits and these boundaries within which we live and the resurrection open up the, the possibility of, of uh, breakthrough to new horizons and, and new discoveries and new understandings of what it means to be a human person. And so it's important to see that this is all done through dialogue, that the emphasis here is on language and narrative and symbols and, and the language of a particular community. And what does it look like for um, people who are, are providing pastoral care to begin to help people recognize their place within a community and to begin to ask questions about the stories and narratives and symbols of the community. And that this pastoral care takes place within the context of a community. It's no longer just this kind of one-on-one, -on -one, how do we help an individual reach self-actualization? It's how do we rec recognize our relatedness and how do we come to understand our relatedness in ways that can lead to flourishing, in ways that can lead to uh, lead to healing. So we also get here um, in this postmodern context is a move away from a clerical paradigm. Who gets to do the pastoral care? Well, increasingly, there's a recognition that it's not just the experts. It's not just the, the pastors um, that provide care. We provide care for one another. So again, that communal emphasis, what does it look like to be a community of mutual care and concern? Um, what does it mean uh, for us to tend to one another's stories and narratives 
uh, and kind of walk alongside one another. And then what's the role of the pastor in this? Um, what does what is, what is the role of, of the pastor begin to look like uh, in this context? So the pastoral parad- or the postmodern paradigm has really pushed a shift that breaks us out of the modern categories and also kind of pushes us back to reclaim some of, of the ways of thinking about pastoral care that you know, we talked about from the, the kind of uh, um, uh, ancient perspective and, and um, the Reformation. And how do those come to play an important role in the way we think about pastoral care today? One of the things that we're going to spend some time on now as we think about pastoral care and as we move into some of the next lectures is to think about uh, narrative and story and how narrative and story play a role in helping us form and shape identity and thinking about how our identity is shaped by language, by the family stories we inhabit, by the systems that we inhabit. And, and to begin to think about institutions as communities that form and shape us with particular ways of speaking. And how does the Christian community um, uh, provide care uh, through narrative? And this is where we can begin to think back to how liturgy and the creeds and confessions and the worship practices that we have and scripture become these, these uh, Im- important places that we, um, that we bring to bear on the care of people within the community. That these are the narratives of God's action in the world. And how then can these narratives, how can we, those of us who are providing pastoral care, whether it be to young people or whomever, help kind of bring them to, together, to bring their narratives together with the, the biblical uh, narrative of God's action in the world. Now, again, as we think about the hermeneutics of pastoral care, um, we're thinking about interpretation. And so eventually we're going to begin talking about, you know, what it means for us to be uh, kind of living in this in-between, where we stand in between the narrative of the the, the community and the individual. And how are we bringing people together? How are we helping people interpret their experiences within the context of the broader community and the broader tradition and in God's action in the world? And so a lot of this is about interpretation. In that, and in that way, pastoral care has this hermeneutical aspect to it, that we have to interpret events. We have to look at the meaning of, of events and think in terms of language and metaphor and kind of the systems of meaning that develop. How do we cultivate a sense of listening and understanding one another where we're trying to, to create a sense of empathy? And, and doing so in a way that brings meaningful action, where we're, we're trying to help kind of bring God's revelation in Jesus Christ to bear upon the world that people are inhabiting. So as we think about worlds, it's important to think about the boundaries that we construct, the worlds that we construct, and yet we want those worlds to be blown open by the world of God's revelation, this world disclosure that... Um, that God is at work and that we have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. And that pastoral care is about helping people open themselves to be able to see God at work and to be able to, to see that past that horizon to what is coming to that new creation, to the hope that God is at work bringing transformation. And that is the eschatological foundation of pastoral action. What do I mean by eschatology? Eschatology speaks to the, the newness, the future that where God is bringing us. And when we think about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it becomes this interpretive key for us that the resurrection is about eschatology, that the resurrection is about new life, and that we, as people who are uh, bringing um, or or doing pastoral ministry and providing pastoral care, we become signs and symbols of uh, resurrection, that we live into the lives of others testifying to, the, to um, you know, the ministry of God in Jesus through death and resurrection that brings newness uh, so that people can begin to redefine their lives, re-narrate their lives, uh, and re-narrate things that have happened to them uh, in their own life um, uh, in the context of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this then becomes the foundation of hope.
that uh, God is at work making all things new. God is at work bringing transformation. Um, and that we are walking alongside people, uh, trying to help open them so that they can be, open their eyes so that they can begin to see how God is at work. And this is what it means to do pastoral care, to, st- to do the in-between. We, we stand in between God's will and human need. We stand in between the church and the world, the biblical story and individual stories. We stand in between hope and faith and doubt and suffering. And what we're going to end up doing is what Root is going to call place sharing. We're inhabiting the in-between spaces. We enter into the lives of people. We enter in and we listen. We enter into their narratives. We enter into their pain and their suffering. And we do so in the context of the narrative of God's action in Jesus Christ. Constantly seeking to, to point people to the gospel and point people to what God is already doing in their lives so that their eyes might be open, so they might come to see their identity differently, and that they might come to live into the new creation, um, the new humanity that, that, that God has revealed uh, in the person of Jesus Christ.